Hello, I'm Alan Lacer. I'm here today in the shop of American Woodworker to talk to you about wood turning gouges. Well, more specifically, what I call the detail spindle gouge. I'm going to take you through a clarification of the different types of wood turning gouges, and then I'm going to shape and sharpen the detail spindle gouge. Then we'll conclude by showing you how to use that particular tool in what we call spindle turning or long grain turning. What I have here on the bench in front of me are the three main types of wood turning gouges. Now right here we have what is known as the spindle roughing gouge and I have it in two different sizes um, and it's not used for bowl work and there's a problem if you do. This tang in the back can be very very weak and so this is what can happen to you in bowl turning. You can snap or bend this off. So it got its name roughing gouge because it was used to take off the corners on a square mounted between centers generally. Uh, also does cylinders and tapers, but not very good for fine detailing. Then the tool that is really for bowl turning is a bowl gouge. And here I have two brand new ones of two different sizes. You can see the difference between that and the spindle roughing gouge. It's a deep fluted gouge very tight close together and as a matter of fact that's one of its names other than a bowl gouge is a deep fluted gouge. Now the gouge that we're really going to be talking about today has many names. Um, I think the most common name would be a spindle gouge and then with some manufacturers whenever they make them very thick underneath the flute uh, they call it a detail gouge but there's no standard for what makes it a detail gouge. And I have now three sizes here uh, this is known as a half, a three-eighths, and a quarter. And these are probably the most common sizes in most uh, between center work. What they all have in common right here is that they have a shallow curve to the flute. And they also will be used with more of an elliptical edge put on them. Now these are brand new and we're going to need to shape them. We're going to need to put a keen edge on them. And then I'll hone it. And that's going to be our next step. Now all the gouges I showed you were brand new and unfortunately most wood turning tools do not come ready to use. Matter of fact this one more than about any other gouge is going to need a lot of reshaping. Now when you buy them new they often come like this. I call this a shovel end, it's square across. Uh, not a very functional tool. It needs to have an elliptical shape put onto it. Occasionally I see them for sale also where they're triangular. That's even a more wicked tool in some ways. Or they've ground them like a bowl gouge with too steep of a bevel, not low enough to get in to do fine work. So what we need to do is to go from this to this shape right here. It's one of the names for this gouge is a fingernail gouge, meaning if your fingernails grew out, they would grow out elliptically. They wouldn't grow out straight across like this or to a sharp point. So we need to convert this new one into this shape. And I'll show you how to do that next at the grinder. Now we're going to be doing this at a dry wheel grinder and in doing so we've got some basic safety concerns. One, you need to protect your eyes. Uh, I'd recommend a minimum of goggles and maybe even preferably a full face shield. And you want them to have the rating of Z87+. plus. That's for high impact. Very important. If you're going to be doing much grinding at all, also you want a mask that has a NIOSH 95 rating on it. I'm holding up a 3M but there's several good brands out there. Other safety considerations, a good solid tool rest and close the gap right here because if you get caught between there or the tool gets caught between there, you're going to have a serious accident. So let's shape it. I'm going to shape this on my course wheel. My drive wheel grinder has a 46 and an 80. 80 is what I put the, uh, let's call it the final grinding finish onto the tool and following that I'll hone it. So very simple to do the shaping of the tool. I set the platform on the grinder. Uh, at 90 or actually up just a little bit. I'm going to hold it flat on the rest and just put this side grinder. There's no real hard and fast feel for how far you come back. If you want to put that elliptical shape, you can get it more left balanced. there. That's all there is to actually putting a shape on it. Now I'll go over to my finer grunt wheel to actually pull the bevel up to match that shape and that'll be our finished edge prior to honing. Now 
how we put an edge on here, there's two basic approaches. One is to do what I call freehand grinding, but using a tool rest, of course. Other one is to use a grinding jig that would actually clamp and hold it. And I'll show you both ways. Um, I prefer this primarily, and it's what I use to teach people too, because I'm going to be imitating wood turning in, a, in an odd way. I'm taking a turning tool. I've got a round object coming down to meet it. I rub the bevel, and I manipulate the edge. Matter of fact, I'm going to mimic some of the moves we use to cut with this tool in the grinding. But I know there's still a place for the grinding jigs. And so let's start by showing you how I would freehand grind this. Set your tool rest at a slight angle upward. Okay, be sure there's no gap right there. I divide the tool into three sectors. The center section I call home, and a right side and a left side. Always start in the middle or the home section. And just lay it on there, use your fingers. You can't really set the platform. And establish that central area. Now I'm still roughing this in a little bit because I changed the shape. So I've got some metal to remove. Now what I'm also doing is establishing the bevel speed. So this particular tool, what's most common is a 25 to 35 degree bevel angle. So I'll check that once I get this ground in. Notice the movement I'm already doing. I'm pushing and twisting. Up the wheel. I'm not going all the way to the side yet. I'm really just trying to establish that central zone. There, now let's check it with a protractor. A protractor is a very good device to have if you're new to turning or if you've been turning a long time. So I lay this part of the protractor into the flute and bring it down and then take a reading and it says I'm at 29 degrees. That's definitely in my 25 to 30. So now I'm going to do the sides. And here's how it's going to look. I'm going to do the left side of the wheel by pushing and twisting up the wheel on the right side of the wheel and bring it right back down. Very little pressure. Watch the spark. I don't want them flooding over the edge yet. I'm not really to my edge. And some turners will actually just do a side at a time, or you can do both sides by alternating. But I like to get one side pretty much finished before I start the other one. So it's a twist and a push up the wheel. Now I'm starting to see some sparks. Let's move to the other side. And it looks like that. Now again, some of this is re-grinding the old bevel, so it takes a little longer for this initial grinding than whenever I return. There, it's looking pretty good. Now let me do one big sweep to connect the three sections together. And what I'm watching for are the sparks. Hopefully you can see those just coming over the top. That means I'm to the edge. If I really let those sparks flood over, I'll burn away the sides and leave a pointy edge or I'll lose my elliptical shape here. So now that's ready to home. Now, if the freehand grinding looks a little daunting to you, or you feel you need something to help you get started, or you like repeatability, there's a lot of good grinding jigs on the market these days. And they all have pretty much the same thing in common. They're going to clamp and hold once you've established the shape and also the angle. Okay, It won't do that for you. You're going to need to do those things. Uh, so I have three here. I'm showing you one that's no longer on the market, but it was really the granddaddy of all of them. This is the Jerry Glazer uh, grinding jig that he developed. Uh, and it just fit onto the floor. Most of them today have a base that they fit into. I have the One Way, which is one of the most common ones out there. And here's one by Hannes Tool. But again, they all have one thing in common. That is they're going to clamp the tool and hold it for you. To manipulate it, where I did it over here just by my freehanding. So let me pick one of these and I'll show you how I would set it up and use it to sharpen the detail spindle gouge. Now I've set this up in the jig that I chose to use and I like to take a uh, sharpie and color in the bevel so that I can tell exactly where I'm going to be grinding because now this tool was ground freehand first so I don't need to change anything about it. The shape is good, bevel angle is good. 
This would just be if I came back to resharpen. So I set it in here and I position this where it's going to match the bevel angle that I have. And here's where the beauty of a jig comes into play is that it's going to do those hand motions a little different, a big sweep. It would have been hard to do freehand. So I just keep bringing it over. And what I'm watching for are the sparks just starting to come over. And then I stop. Okay, and then we have it sharpened. Now we just have one last thing to do before we start turning, that is hone the edge. Honing's going to do two things for us. It's going to refine this edge, and also though I'm going to use it for between grindings to maintain the sharp edge, and that way I can work sometimes for days without going back to the grinder if I'll hone a little bit all the time. There's two basic approaches here to how I would hone a gouge. One is to use a flat hone for the outside of the bevel, and that can come in small paddles, it comes a strip like this, or a larger rectangular, but a flat hone. And so I either put it down on a surface like this, or while I'm turning, I just put it against my body, but I'll do it here on this bench top so you can see what I'm doing. Keep your fingers back, start on the back of the bevel, never come right at the edge, it'll roll over your edge. So start at the back of the bevel, now we got a slight hollow grind, and so what's going to happen is I tip it forward, it's going to have a two-point contact on the back of the bevel, then right below the cutting edge. I'm working on the plane that forms the cutting edge rather than just hitting the edge itself. Invariably I would roll it or dub the edge over. So go over it a couple of times like that. Now the inside though needs to be worked because I have a horrendous burr on the inside in modern steels like this that are high speed steel, that burr does not come off readily while you're turning. So I need something that's curved. Uh, one solution is to have here a tapered cone or a round rod, and I'm using diamond for a reason too, because modern high speed steel responds very well to diamond and even boron hones, which are now on the market. But it doesn't do so well with traditional hones like Arkansas stones, Washita stones, India stones. So diamond is really my first choice, but I, I will also use boron if, if uh, I have those type of homes. So hold this flat, dead flat in the flute, and just follow the shape as it goes around. It won't take very much to slip or hone the inside. And that's it. Now another option is to use a slip stone. And when I say a slip stone, it's got a teardrop shape to it. And this one uh, turns out to be diamond. And I'm going to do it the same way. It's got two flat surfaces with diamond on both sides. And I just manipulate it, follow the shape, have that two-point contact. Again, never come off the back of your bevel, and it's that quick. Now, I slip the inside with one of the radiuses. In this case, either radius would fit. I'll use the larger one. Just hold it dead flat, dead flat in the flute, and there. And once I'm working, when I hone with diamond, it'll only take me maybe 30 seconds to a minute to hone this. And always right before any kind of finish cuts or the first hint of dulling, hone the tool. Again, it refines the edge and it maintains the edge so you can keep working with sharp tools. Before we start making things, we really need to practice. And I recommend practicing like this. Uh, I've got a very soft wood here to learn in. It's poplar. Alder's a good choice or a pine. Probably not with many knots in it would be my, my advice. Uh, don't get them very long. You don't need them more than probably six inches long. And round this up with a roughing gouge or a skew chisel to make a cylinder. And there's two cuts that this tool really shines with. One is the concave or the hollow. And the other one is a convex or a roll shape. Often we call these coves and beads, but of course they don't have to be a cove or bead. It's the concave convex cut. Let's start with a concave. And rather than just jump right into it and making a, a true cove like we would see in, in turning, uh, I find it's a lot better to practice and to learn on the ends of a cylinder. Because you may find out one side is far more difficult for you than another and you can focus on correcting uh, on that side that is your, your problem area. So here's how we're going to do it. Protect your eyes. Now the tool is going to start on its side. 
It's going to start on its side. It's not like in wood carving where we tended to use them like this with a flute up. For this particular cut, for concave, we're going to start on its side. We're going to cut into the wood, and it's got a little push and twist to it. A little push and a twist. Starts on its side, and at the bottom of the curve, the flute now is pointed upwards. So there's a little push and a twist. Note also how I'm holding the tool. This is a finesse operation to wood turning. We don't need a heavy clasp fist like this. I'm actually holding it the same way you would a, a pencil. Now I'm going to come to the other side and do the same thing. Keep doing this until you get two things. One, you've got control of the tool and you get a nice curve forming. And that comes from that little, almost a corkscrew motion of a twist as it's going in. Now here's going to be your biggest problem, other than producing a good form, is going to be the problem of the run back. This is very, very common. And this is what trashes a keeper piece. So that's why you need to practice before you make things. Because if this had been a piece almost finished and I got a run back, it would have run all the work to the side. That's called a run back because it always goes backwards of the direction you're going. It's not a dig in or a catch. It's actually where the edge has nothing to back it up for the bevel. So how do you counteract that? Well, there's a number of solutions. One, if I present the tool like this vertically and I have almost a knife edge and I can hit 90 degrees, it'll cut a little shoulder. Now once I'm in to the cut, I can continue the cut with no run back. Another solution that often helps people, because at 90 degrees you have to hit just perfect almost or you'll get a run back. That is push the handle, the back of the handle, towards the opening just a few degrees. And what that will do is cut in and create the shoulder. Now pull it back, keep your rotation and movement going like that until you get to the bottom. So again, push it back, you know, in until you get the curve. Same thing over here. In the article that this is supplementing, the way we explained it was, if you have 90 degrees, you're okay. Or if you're uh, less than 90 this direction or towards the opening. But if you come back more than 90, it's going to run back like that. Okay? So that's what we're trying to control are the run backs. You may find also that the right side is harder for the right hander and the left side is a little easier. One part of the reason is for the right hander, the backhand motion is unnatural. We're going this way to the left is very natural. For a left-hander, that would be reversed. Well, here's one of the solutions. Roll your hand back where you start a little unnatural, and as you finish the cut, you end very natural with everything in alignment. Next one I'll do is make a cove in the middle. Now, let's try a true cove. Now, there's a saying in wood turning that the tools work better if they can move into air. That's one of the reasons for practicing on the end of a cylinder, so I don't have to fight so many fibers. Well, the way we do that in reality is to take a parting tool and part in to where the bottom of the cove is going to be, like that. I only went about a third the way of the diameter, and that's more than enough. Now, I need to do a right and a left. Now, the way I'm going to do this is two or three passes per side, one that goes right into that cut that I've made with a parting tool, then I'm going to back up. And that way I won't have to fight the fibers so much. So it's going to look like this. One, two, three, one, two, and three. Now, I don't have the, the full shape yet, so now I'm going to come all the way to the bottom. And this is what it's going to, going to look like. Now I'll get the other side more or less to mirror that. And that's the cove. That area in the very bottom, I do just a little bit of scraping with the tip, and I have one side more or less mirrors the other side. That's the objective, being curves. Now let's take a look at the convex cut. Now let's take a look at the convex cut. Um, same thing again. I've rounded up a cylinder. I'm using poplar again. Uh, I'm going to work on the ends of the cylinder before I actually lay out and do a full bead. 
So what we're going to do is start with it upright, roll it onto its side. So in a way, it's kind of the mirror image of what we just did with the cove. So here's what it looks like. Again, protect your eyes. Put the bevel on there. Lift, and then there's a rotation, a lift with a rotation. It's got a little twist to it also. That's how it gets the curve. Lift and a rotation. And when it gets to the bottom of the curve, the tool then is completely onto its side. Come over to the other end of the cylinder and practice going to the left. Lift and a rotation. What I'm looking for here is the nice curve, nice full curve. And that really comes from this lift and a twist and a rotation. You don't normally get runbacks with this, but what you do have trouble with is getting good form. Okay? If one side is giving you more trouble than the other in terms of getting a good shape, do the whole cylinder just on that side and keep making changes until you figure out the body motion and the movement of the tool. So upright, rub bevel, lift, and rotation. Actually a pretty quick rotation to get a nice full curve here on a piece like this. Now let me lay out to do a full bead for you. So here's how I would lay out to do a bead. Let's Again, let's start with a parting tool. And let's just do it in the middle of the, of the uh, cylinder. Be nice to yourself. Don't do very small, tight bead jets. Same with the coves. Give yourself some working room until you really understand the mechanics of the tool. So there, I'm doing one probably about an inch. And I'll cut away some wood for you so you can see a little better, too. That's the mark of a parting tool. <laughs> kind of rags up the fibers. This way you should be able to see a little better. Now here's what helps me, because I'm trying to get a mirror image, and I don't want my, my beads pointing. So here's one solution, is take a pencil and kind of smear across what is the center, not just a center line. I'm going to stay out of that area so that I have more or less a little flat on top of the bead, so if I hit it with some sandpaper, the top will pull into the sides. Otherwise, I'd end up with crown beads or pointy beads, which don't look very good. So it's the same thing again. I don't try to do this in one fell swoop. What I do is remove some wood out in front with a couple of passes. Now I'm going to roll that side and come all the way to the bottom. There it took me four passes in there. I'm down to the bottom. Now I come to the other side. One, two, and three. Now I'm going to look and see if I need to change the shape just a little to get it to mirror the other side. There we go. And now I've got me a nice bead. I'll show you here, I'll end with show you some practicing ideas and thoughts. If you really want to get good at this, you're going to have to practice. I think wood turners should draw from two groups that understand how you learn something. Musicians and athletes do two things. They practice and they warm up. And I'd recommend that you do that. Well, maybe your first approach at doing coves is just to work on the ends of cylinders and a few in the middle. Then do a whole stick that is nothing but coves, perhaps of the same size. But if you really want to advance your skills, try this. And this is in the article showing that I start with a cove that's an inch and a quarter wide, then an inch and an eighth, then an inch, then seven eighths, then three quarters, down to a very small size. And you'll find out there's a limit to how tight you can go with a particular width of, of uh, uh, gouge. Either we go to a smaller gouge or we bring out the elliptical shape a little bit longer so we can get in there and work it. Then I do the same with beads. I'd maybe do a stick here of all beads of the same size and then I would set it out to do beads of progressively uh, smaller sizes. Well, I hope this has been instructional for you and I, I really hope it's given you some ideas on how to perfect your skill at this amazing tool. And I also hope that you'll keep following us in American Woodworker, our turning articles, because we've got some great ones in the works. Thank you.